So with that quick introduction to Sue, for those who don't know her, uh, which is, it would be very hard to not know her, but she was the CEO of the Gates Foundation up until um, last year. Um, prior to that, she was also the chancellor of UCSF. In fact, she was the first female chancellor of UCSF. Um, and then for all us tech nerds, she was actually the pro president of product development at Gen Genentech, um, which was huge. Um, and she served on multiple boards, everything from Procter & Gamble to um, Facebook and today Pfizer. As someone who has some weird um, kettle noises, that sound, please mute. <laughs> um, so that's a very, very brief introduction. So she's had a prolific career um, and a very impressive one. But before we get started with the rest of the questions, I would love to know from you, Sue, if there's anything about you that we should know that's not on the internet or on Wikipedia. Ah, the, uh, probably the thing that's not on the internet or Wikipedia is how much um, I'm a family person. Um, I, I, I'm one of seven kids and wow. my husband is one of seven kids. And um, one of the things I'm really excited to be back in, near San Francisco as I'm closer to my family. And uh, so that's something where we all try and do sports together up at Tahoe and have fun. And uh, you know, the Wikipedia never picks up on that stuff. <laughs> How many children do you have? None. <laughs> we always laugh. My husband also does global health. He's an HIV doctor, also trained at UCSF. And uh, the, it, it, our life up until this last year has just been travel and move around and all this. So we always laugh. We don't have any kids and we don't have any pets. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, that, that is an interesting um, choice. But then speaking of choices, um, what would be the hardest decision you've ever made in your career? Uh, probably the hardest decision in many ways. I would say two, and they were, they were big changes. So when I left private practice, I was a private practice oncologist, and I went to Bristol Myers Squibb um, to move to in private industry. And I thought that I, you know, I was worried I was going to the dark side in private industry. I was very unsure what it would be like. Um, it turns out, by the way, I thought it was the best job I ever had. I got to work on Taxol at Bristol Myers. I got to learn about regulation and FDA and statistics. And I loved everything about it. I, it turns out I'm sort of instinctively a product developer, instinctively a product developer. Um, but the second hardest decision was going to UCSF um, to be chancellor um, from Genentech because I was not a professor. <laughs> I was nervous that you know I would be a fish out of water, and uh, um, and that I enjoyed a lot too. I love teaching. I love being around students and the energy and the. Um, I actually like the research orientation of UCSF because it's such a special place that way. Um, but that both those decisions caused me many sleepless nights. So that would imply the decision to join the Gates Foundation was pretty easy. You know, uh, Bill and Melinda would tell you that it wasn't easy because I gave them a bit of a hard time. Um, uh, they, uh, I, I felt like they pushed me to say I was the perfect person for the job at that point in time. They wanted somebody who could be a product developer and a scientist, and they wanted someone female. Um, and uh, they, they felt like they needed me and UCSF would be able to replace me. <laughs> so I couldn't <laughs> argue with that, honestly. <laughs> they, they were good salespeople. I, I believe that. I feel like the tech industry in particular are very good salespeople. Really good. Really, really good. I, I thought if I need to sell somebody, I should call them up. <laughs> um, there are a lot of questions we want to ask, but um, I want to address the big elephant in the room and get it out of the way. <laughs> Uh, so we can get to some of the other uh, questions. And that's mostly about the COVID vaccine rollouts. Um, the, the first question is that um, 
Is there, I mean, you know, we're seeing these plans, like we've, uh, I think it was just yesterday or day before yesterday, where there were about uh, over 2 million vaccines that were doled out in a single day, which is amazing. Um, right. In December, there were just a few thousand a day. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the rollout from now onwards until we actually get the entire US population vaccinated? And is there anything, um, like is the main problem just receiving the vaccines or is the distribution and also uh, giving the vaccines a big bottleneck? Yeah, so, so let me just start by saying I'm optimistic um, and I'm thrilled that we have uh, vaccines that are as good as Moderna and Pfizer's vaccine. I mean, it's just 94, 95% so far exceeded any of our expectations. That's thrilling. Um, the, the, uh, the supply is limited. That will get better. It, over the next three months, it will continue to get better. And by June, I think we'll be in much better shape. So the, the supply limitations are difficult. The, the transportation with the cold chain and the freezing is difficult and the two doses is difficult. Um, so everything about how you give this vaccine is, is harder than I wish it was. On the other hand, I have to give the Biden administration a lot of credit. They have just put their heads down and they pushed hard and they've gone, they went over 1 million a day, they went over one and a half million a day, now over 2 million. So I feel like they've got a little bit of momentum. I think people out in the, the country all over and communities are doing a good job. I, I am in the camp of people. Um, by the way, my husband disagrees with me. <laughs> so it would just is fine. So I'll give the other side of this story. I think that the constraints have been too tough. I mean, I, you know, I don't want people to cheat. But I think if we just simply it, do the healthcare workers first, that was good and is good, and they're in the hospitals and clinics, so you can do that. But then just go down the age ladder. We should make the uh, the the brackets as simple as possible. If if I come into you and I say I have a chronic illness or I work in a grocery store, how do you know that? I mean, I don't want to make it hard for people. I want to say, okay, are you 50, 60, 70? So I think that we should simplify as much as we can those criteria, especially since we're gonna get everybody vaccinated over the next three to six months. But the, the, um, I hope that by the end of summer, it will be much more likely that um, we can say that we've, we've really hit high, high levels of vaccine coverage. And given the new strains of the vaccine, um what will be the impact on how the vaccines, um, I mean, what would be the impact of vaccinating the entire population? And also, has there been any precedents like this before? Like, have there been other viruses that have evolved as quickly? Well, you know, flu evolves every year. We have not need a new vaccine for flu. So um, the thing that's unusual about this vaccine is not that it's such a, so far, such a terribly mutating vaccine. It's that so many people have it. And it's global and it's mil hundreds of millions of people in the world have COVID. I, I still think, which is partly my sense of urgency about vaccinating, I still think we can stay ahead of the variants. That's partly why we need to go so quickly in the US. And it may be that as the, the variants come about, I don't say this lightly, but it could be necessary that we have a third booster. So let's say you're getting Pfizer or Moderna, you get a second booster. And if there's a variant that's in the community, you may need a third booster. And the companies are already looking at how they can edit the vaccine to be specific for these new variants. But the, the virus has to live in people to mutate. Yep. So our best bet for not having to do that, the virus do that is, you know, wear a mask, keep your distance and get vaccinated. The less prevalent the vaccine is in the population, the more we escape this, this uh, variant problem. Awesome. And so having said all that, you would imagine if we uh, inoculated most of the US population within six months, life would go back to normal? If we could inoculate everyone, yes. 
I would I would imagine that because that would it, would this normal it, imply no masks and business as usual or normal means business as usual with masks? Well, remember we don't know we know the vaccine protects against getting very sick or being in the hospital. We don't yet know if the vaccine protects you from spreading. We suspect it will, but we don't know that. So it normal could mean that you go about your business, but you need to wear a mask, especially as we're doing the studies to give us increased confidence. Um, but if people don't get sick and don't go in the hospital, um, you know, it's, it's less of an issue. I'm more worried about coverage than uh, if we got the kind of coverage you're talking about, I'd be thrilled. But the vaccine hesitancy we still see and people opting out, even healthcare workers opting out, which shocked me. Um, some people are on the sidelines sort of waiting to see, you know, it, uh, I've, I've said this before about having, uh, I, I got eye surgery, you know, how you get uh, LASIK surgery. Yeah. I said, I want to be patient 1 million. <laughs> you know, I want to see what 999,999 people experience and then I'll go. And I think with the vaccine, what? I mean, again, your background is incredibly uh, fascinating. And uh, just from your perspective, um, what intersection of technology and biology is most exciting for you in the next decade? Oh, um, I'm, I think some of these new gene editing, um, CRISPR and some of the other rapid gene editing technologies, um, uh, if you combine that with mRNA and the new cell therapy, like for cancer, um, that constellation of new uh, technologies for how we um, cure diseases, for me is just off the charts. It's faster, it's more precise. Um, what I've seen done, I never thought we'd be able to do. And I'm just really excited about that. But would the applications be therapeutic? Would they be uh, more preventative? What exactly would that look like um, to the end patient? Yeah, so early on, more therapeutic. Um, and uh, so that uh, the cell therapy for cancer, you have cancer and you're treated. Um, the, the, uh, um, the, the promise of something like the CRISPR technology and gene therapy is that you see mistakes in the genome and you correct them um, for an individual patient. Um, I'm not talking about like designer babies. I'm talking about a baby's born, but you can fix what's wrong. Um, mm. And so I think that that's, that's the, the, and the evolution in cancer will go as early as possible because we have these new like what people call a liquid biopsy, the, the earlier we can detect evidence of cancer, if we can turn on your immune system um, and shut that off, I think that's um, remarkable. I, I frankly wish that I was more enthusiastic about prevention, mm -hmm. um, but I feel like we, th there's two areas of prevention that have frustrated me. One is that we can, we can diagnose a tendency at, um, so reliably and so fast that we can prevent, like let's say a woman has breast cancer, that we know there's something there and short of doing something that's very difficult like having a prophylactic mastectomy, we could just, there's a signal and we turn down the signal. I hope we'll get to that day, but we're not there yet or even close yet. But the other thing I'm, uh, I've been obsessed by for a long time and yet I don't see as much progress as I'd like is just wellness. You know, if you're, as you get out of school, I feel like everyone should enter their, their teens and their adult life in a way that they can use technology and they can use their own risk for disease to have as, as healthy and um, enjoyable a life as you can. Um, and I think that that should be possible, but I don't, you know, I see, I, I have my Apple Watch. I, I know how fast my run goes, <laughs> but, you know, I don't really see that I'm, I'm in a customized wellness experience like I'd like to see. Gotcha. Um, 
I want to dig more on that, but I also have so many other questions. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll jump to one of the other ones. Um, you talked about a bunch of that stuff. I remember um, I heard you speaking about precision medicine almost six years ago um, at UCSF, and you were really excited about that back then. Um, and so was I, like, you know, yeah. I mean, to have like, you know, to have a diagnosis and like um, therapeutic cures and like have everything based on an individual's um, uh, history and also like, you know, the genome and every other piece of information you can get sounds like, sounds amazing because right That's now, sometimes medicine feels more art than it does science. Um, but I haven't really seen much progress on that front. And I haven't seen a lot of adoption, at least as a patient, when I go um, into hospitals on that front. And I was wondering like what the big issues or hurdles there were. Yeah, so, so it's funny. I think it is um, like many things in medicine slower than anyone would hope, but I, I co-wrote the, the um, uh, National Academy report that some people think coined the term precision medicine in 2011, which is pretty, uh, pretty shocking a decade ago. Um, they, there's a part of this is actually good news. It's business as usual. If someone does go to a physician with lung cancer, breast cancer, you would never treat that patient without a precision medicine approach. Like it's, it's normal now. So people don't even use the word because it's like how you treat people. What I think is, is less the case is if you went in and you had rheumatoid arthritis, it's very much, okay, we'll try medicine A, then B, then C, not precise, not directed by a diagnostic. And so I would say in oncology, we've made a ton of progress, need to make more, but ton of progress. It's now business as usual. But in things like immunology, diabetes, some of the areas that we had dreams, you would really have breakthroughs, much more to do on that front. And what I think in part has stalled it, well, now what's stalled everything is COVID. <laughs> Everything's stalled by COVID. But what stalled it is the, um, there's just, in oncology, we had this sort of roadmap where one thing after another gave us incremental gains. And I would say that in these other areas, in metabolic disease and immunology, we've had less of a roadmap. So there's some of the basic work uh, needs to be there. And one area that you see a lot in the news with basic work needs to make it more precise is Alzheimer's disease. Um, it, it, there's so many product failures and that's specifically because there's no roadmap. So one of the thoughts, even like back about six to seven years ago, when I heard your talk, I was like, this is so ripe for technologists to help because it's ultimately a big data problem. Um, and back then I myself was in transition and like, you know, medicine and um, uh, healthcare was really fascinating for me. And I just wanted to learn more about the field, but the more I dug in, the more discouraged I got. Um, because like it was really difficult um, to build a product in the area and get traction for it. So the go to market basically was infeasible. Um, and for all those people out there who you know want to get into healthcare and want to help solve these kinds of problems and want to build companies around these problems, how like is there a hack? Um, is there like a silver bullet <laughs> to help with uh, the go to market? Yeah, no, I, I tend to be a pragmatist. Um, diagnostics are hard in part because they're poorly reimbursed. Their regulatory path is difficult and precision medicine requires a diagnostic. If, if I had any hack, it's, it's the old thing of uh, go where the money is. If, you know, we made a great diagnostic for Herceptin, the breast cancer drug, because we had a therapeutic that people would reimburse for. So this, this joining of the, the precise technologic breakthrough with the uh, um, therapeutic gave a kind of free ride to the diagnostic. And I think that's the thing that is so important is to, to figure out in medicine where there's an area that's enough well, inversed, well reimbursed that a little piece of that pie can go to your thing. Because otherwise you don't have a go to market because nobody's going to pay for it which is sad, but it's just true. 
Yep. Okay, I'm going to ask maybe two more questions. Um, and sorry, we're jumping around so much. If we had like three hours with you, we would be <laughs> digging a lot deeper. <laughs> Um, but uh, there's a lot of interest, obviously, um, about your work with the Gates Foundation. Um, and, you know, you, you launch a lot of projects and I had to find out the whys behind the projects or why it mattered or why it was interesting. Um, but before I ask you questions about your work there, um, I, there, there was this one question that came up over and over again is what is your advice for individuals or organ organizations trying to pitch? the Gates Foundation. Is that even feasible? Um, the Gates Foundation doesn't take pitches. They go out and say, here's what we want. Um, but what I would say is there, the GatesFoundation.org is actually really good. The GatesFoundation.org puts exactly what every one of the programs is looking for, what their intention is. Um, every year in, in uh, um, February and March, Bill and Melinda review every program at Gates Foundation. And so they have what's called an approved strategy. And the approved strategies show where their funding goes. It's straightforward, that's where their funding goes. What isn't, what doesn't work is to go astray and try and talk them into new things. It's like, that's not worth the time. But if you, I'll, I'll give you an example that um, Bill has been really interested in a universal flu vaccine. So some ap academics have been working on universal flu. That's the kind of thing that they've got a portal of entry to say, here's my idea. Are you interested in funding it? So the, in the education space, there's a lot of interest, especially with COVID on ed tech and on new ways of learning and, and keeping students engaged. Um, so ed tech, the, the uh, gatesfoundation.org and the, the uh, K through 12 program all outlined. So use the website. It actually tells you what they're doing. Sweet. So you just mentioned um, the universal flu vaccine. Uh, lately, I've been hearing a lot about um, solving the world's diseases in our lifetime. Um, is that realistic or is that just, again, really optimistic speak? Um, I, I had a big argument with Mark Zuckerberg about this, <laughs> and it was one of those arguments that we both went away saying we won, <laughs> but I know who won. Um, <laughs> I, I honestly, I think it's ridiculous. Um, I, I, uh, I think, you know, having an aspiration, my aspirations in life, I mean, my sort of life view is to decrease suffering and enhance people's ability to enjoy their life. I mean, that's like, that's been my motto since I decided I wanted to go to medical school at age eight. So like, I haven't veered the course, just like we're seeing with the COVID uh, virus mutating, diseases have a way of outsmarting us and the, the, the ultimate disease is aging. Um, and so I think if, it, if, if you're interested, at least for me, for a rally cry or an interesting thing, um, having a longer, um, more productive life is, is a really great goal, but I'm not into eradicate all diseases. That's, it just, it isn't, um, I'm not sure if it's a kind of a science argument for me or it's a philosophical argument. I think it's the latter. Um, okay. Uh, Again, I have a lot of questions, but I think I might skip over um, to questions from the group um, because we try to make these interactive and not a TV sitcom. Um, so <laughs> with, uh, with that, um, I'm, I'm trying to read the questions in chat as quickly as I can. Um, but I, um, I love Tamina's question. So Tamina, if you want to unmute and ask it, that would be great. Sure, sure. I'm curious what your greatest regret is having left the Gates Foundation, this most powerful agent for development. What did you not get to accomplish or introduce while you were there? Oh, and polio. Um, you know, one of the things that is a massive undertaking at Gates Foundation is to end polio, which would be only the second human disease ever eradicated. And we, we were so close 
but in Afghanistan and Pakistan, because of the unrest there and difficulties, and then across the Horn of Africa, some of the type two polio, um, uh, uh, we had some outbreaks there. So we didn't, as Bill likes to say, you know, Bill Gates says, we'll invite you to the party. <laughs> I'm sure I'll go to the party, but we didn't get to end polio, which, you know, those are the kinds of big uh, ideas that rally people around and keep them going. So that would have been a good one. Um, Noah, do you want to ask one of your three questions? Sure. Um, I'll ask the middle one. Hi, I really Hi. enjoyed this talk so far. Thank you. Um, I'm curious. So healthcare is getting more expensive over time. And um, in the future, you could imagine there's going to be $10 healthcare, $1 healthcare um, provided to everyone uh, around the world. I'm Sorry, curious can how- you, uh, Can I ask you why you can imagine that? I couldn't imagine that in like three sure. generations. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we're techno optimists, hopefully. And you look at going from accessing information in a library to Google search, which is totally automated, totally digitized, totally free. It seems like whenever you can digitize something, then it can become sort of globally scalable. Um, so maybe implicit in the question is how can we digitize healthcare, but I don't want to be prescriptive. I guess like how can we move towards uh, making healthcare orders of magnitude cheaper for everyone in the world? Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Well, a couple um, comments. One thing, I, there, there's, um, some literature that I think is fascinating about why over the last couple of decades, costs for a lot of things that can be done technically, you know, costs for a camera, costs for a computer have come down, but costs for uh, healthcare, costs for education have gone up or stayed up and even increased. And the, the best thinking on why that is, is that it involves humans. Um, and, you know, humans are expensive. So, one of the things I think we should learn from COVID, and I think it's gonna, um, it, it is incumbent on us to push ourselves to keep going with these observations. What part of education, what part of healthcare, which is what I'm really interested in, these remote visits, not going to the doctor as often, not seeking care, self-care, um, what, what actually do we feel like that was good? We had to do more of that so that we can digitize or use technology for more of medicine and save the expensive human pieces or the hospital related pieces that are also expensive um, for the things that must be done that way. I think that's our best opportunity to, to bend the curve. In the absence of that, it's going to keep getting worse. Thank you. I will say though, I found out that, that at least for me, I, I can do a televisit. I can do a lot of self-monitoring. I cannot give myself a haircut. <laughs> that require, and you know, that's a real up close and personal thing. So that, that I'm not getting a haircut till I get a vaccine. Um, <laughs> sweet, Radu, do you wanna ask your question? Is he still here? Mitra, why don't you go next? Hi, so this, this conversation is just wonderful. Thank you for making time for us. Um, I was in particular inspired by a lot of your comments about cancer immunotherapy, which is um, a cause that I have a personal connection to and I'm working hard on in my non-South Park Commons life. So I'd love to know um, across everything you're looking at doing next, um, you know, what are uh, some things that you're focused on? What are some roles you might take on in your new location? Is cancer immunotherapy on the list? You know, what, what's next for Sue? Well, um, uh, now that uh, I am past 10 years where I had conflicts of interest, so I was at uh, UCSF and then Gates Foundation and could not sit, and I didn't think I should sit on any pharma or biotech boards. Um, I joined Pfizer's board in April um, which actually, to my surprise, you know, the, they're in the middle of the COVID vaccine development. And it's just been such a great experience. I have really, really enjoyed participating in the board and learning about uh, how they got there and where they are now. But I also joined the board of a small uh, uh, 
private company called uh, Resilience. And they do production, specifically production for things like cell and gene therapy. And um, the reason I wanted to join the board is that tends to be rate limited. If you can scale and reliably produce some of these newer ways of uh, treating people, the cost will come down and there, there'll be opportunities to treat more people for more diseases. And so the, the neat thing about that is I get to see a very broad view of these new therapies because I'm not at one company doing one thing. Um, and so that, that aspect I'm really motivated by, especially as we, it gets safer for me to interact with people. Um, I'm hoping to be more involved locally. I'm involved at UC Berkeley and UCSF as an adjunct professor, but I, I think in addition to the sort of high tech stuff that I get at the boards I'm on now, I love public health. And I, it, you know, I talked about how healthcare should improve post COVID. I would love for us to push ourselves in this country to, to improve our public health access and how people can get public health. If, if we were doing vac vaccine distribution with an intact public health system, life would be different and better. I love I think, it. Thank you so much. I think on that front, Ina had a question, um, which was, you know, if you want to ask it, like, it was more about like other, go ahead, Ina. Yeah, um, yeah sure. Because um, we mentioned that, uh, first of all, thank you so much. This is extremely educational for me. I do not come from healthcare background. My startup is in a very different direction. But um, what's interesting to me is that we started speaking about the cost of healthcare uh, being extremely high and going higher. Um, that is really the case with the US. And it's not really the case everywhere in the world, sadly enough. Are there certain structural um, changes or structural ideas we can, um, I wouldn't say import, but maybe implement something that, you know, we can learn from the world outside of US to lower the cost and just do better healthcare? Yeah, well, there's two things. One is sort of on the low tech and what is on the high tech. I was so struck by places like Ethiopia and Rwanda, who are so um, um, algorithmic with how they do healthcare. You know, if you're 20 years old, if you need this, it, you know, it, it's sort of like what people see when their child needs well baby care. There's a certain time when you get certain uh, vaccinations. There's a certain time when you measure them. You know, there's the it, healthcare from a public health standpoint, it um, can be regularized. It can be regularized. You do it on a schedule. That's actually good for your health to have at certain, you know, you get a colonoscopy when you're 50. <laughs> These things help your health. And so that regularization um, combined with people who in Ethiopia, they have people with a third grade education who were the frontline healthcare workers who were plenty good for very routine things that their population needed. So I think that that routinizing healthcare with people, individuals who have uh, um, uh, a degree and can learn and can be taught on the job, very important. But then the high tech piece of it is, one of the things that we all need to figure out is how to combine appropriate concern about privacy with the ability to use tech and just keep big databases um, on people so that we can care better for our, our uh, citizens. In the UK, they've done some of the most amazing studies in COVID and part of it is they have a nationalized healthcare system and they keep records. Keeping national records on your population can really help you gain insights and bring down uh, your costs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, makes sense. Um, I will read out Radu's question because his internet connection is uh, choppy. He says that even if we uh, manage to inoculate the U.S. population, um, how does how does like you know um, vaccinating the world at large um, make an impact? Like, will we continuously be chasing variants? Do we have to have like certain percentage of the world's population um, vaccinated um, for it to for life to truly get back to normal? Um, and what does that look like? So that is such an excellent question. The, the, um, it, we definitely need 
for the world to be involved in the vaccination program. I'm glad that we're back into WHO because that will help. And there is a um, Gates Foundation have worked with WHO and some other global organizations that do vaccines to put together funding that's now being used. In fact, the WHO this morning made the first allocations of vaccines to low income countries. So that, that effort has just started. Those countries are going to need uh, to depend on a few things. One is the newer vaccines that don't have the cold chain supply uh, challenges that Moderna and Pfizer do. And secondly, um, the, uh, in, as is the case in India, local production and local manufacturing. Um, I don't think most people know that India um, uh, manufactures more than 80% of the world's vaccines. Um, but I certainly appreciate that. And, and they've got now deals and will uh, produce uh, coronavirus vaccine. And that's going to help a lot on costs and on uh, supply. And then relatedly, um, someone else, I believe, that I asked, like, again, for the world to go back to normal. And we probably don't have any data on this, but is it going to be necessary for children to be vaccinated? And when will those studies be done? Yeah, we don't have data. Actually, the Pfizer now has gone down to age 12, but the studies in children are only just beginning. Um, it, seemed, it would surprise me if we didn't need to vaccinate kids. The children in this um, pandemic, it's been interesting. They, it, cause it's the opposite of, I mean, anybody who's seen a kid with a runny nose knows their, kids are great spreaders of infectious diseases mm -hmm. and in flu, they always are. So this seems different, but I think most um, infectious disease docs feel that we will need to study, which we'll do now uh, and ultimately uh, vaccinate children. Okay. Um, last call, um, uh, uh, Aiden, if you want to ask your question and then, um, I'm going to end with two questions, but go for it. Cool. Well, I started reading, uh, first of all, thank you for this amazing, um, really loving it. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I started reading David Sinclair's lifespan, uh, just in the beginning. So I, by no means on an armchair. If, if barely, but I'm curious about your perspective on aging and whether sort of recent advances in research are really going to sort of, are, are they fundamental and, and whether they'll start to change our perspective on aging in sort of the long term? Again, kind of a lofty question, but I'm very curious. Yeah, it's a lofty question. I don't, I'm not sure I'm up to it. <laughs> That's, so, you know, it's interesting. The, uh, my old boss from Genentech, Art Levinson, uh, um, went to Calico the, the uh, Google-funded um, biotech. And it, what was, here's what was interesting about how he started their research agenda. He started by tackling neurodegenerative diseases and cancer. So as you age, the big problems tend to be you get cancer, you get uh, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's. Um, and these are diseases that often uh, um, cause a lot of morbidity and mortality. The, the, the topic of aging itself, I, I sort of struggle with, and I alluded to it before, because aging could be seen of as disease-like, or aging could be seen as like a part of life. You know, you get older and you die. So, so I, I think there's um, two, th this is an area where I'd love to see more serious biology. Um, and the, and yet the serious biology is impeded by a lack of really crisp endpoints or good ways of measuring. So um, there are fields and Alzheimer's I would put in this category like aging, where I feel like we need to crawl before we can walk. We need to break disease down. Any, anything we seem to solve as humans, you do have the stages of a disease, you have measurements so that you know what you're doing and that when your intervention makes an impact, you know. And those are the things that most of the aging research that I've ever read is missing. Cool, thank, thank you for that very thoughtful response. I appreciate it. Um, I have one question and then Jonathan, uh, you can end the session for us. Um, my question is that, um, you know, in the world of foundations and philanthropies and billions of dollars um, thrown at solving these problems, um, 
you know, there's there's obviously the giving aspects of things, but a lot of people in our community want to be involved in philanthropic causes. And I often have been very overwhelmed when I hear about the dollar amounts or the things that people are doing. And someone sat me down and told me the story of Malaria No More and how they started off with a couple of million dollars. Um, and that set off the campaign to eradicate malaria. Um, I. I guess the question for you is like, how should like, you know, you know, technologists who've done reasonably well, which a large subset of this group is, but are not necessarily billionaires think about philanthropy other than just giving um, money at the end of the year. So, so I would say two things on that. I love the malaria example because the, the ability to make a difference isn't directly related to the amount of money. Um, it's, it is passionate people who are heads down, um, uh, dogged about a cause. So the first thing that I think is really important is to get excited about something that excites you, you know, that's, um, and whether it's malaria or polio or, or whatever it is, I think that's just important for everyone, no matter how much the money is. Um, and the, the second thing I would say though, is it's important to look at the times we're in and that's related to what moves you. And I'll give myself as an example, I'm, I'm not a billionaire, but last year I couldn't believe that people were standing in line to get food. It just, it's, you know, we're in America and people stood in line to get food. So, so we moved a lot of our personal philanthropy in two, 2020 to, to um, organizations that feed people. And the last time we had done that in the big way was when HIV um, hit San Francisco and Project Open Hand brought food to people's homes because they couldn't leave their house because they were too sick. So I think that those sorts of things of the times you're in and where you can help. Um, but you, you know, uh, Mackenzie Scott just became a philanthropist and she just knew that historically black colleges weren't getting funded. And I just think, great, she just wrote a check. You know, so I, I think people uh, um, overestimate how much just thinking, okay, I'm moved by this and I'm going to make sure that I contribute in some way, especially if it's somebody who might be obscure. Um, so, you know, uh, you don't have to be a billionaire to make a difference. And it sounds like you don't have to be uber organized about it. Either I don't way. think so. I, you know, people, and, and it's interesting, I definitely um, was, uh, Bill Gates had a big impact on me. He, you know, we had an auditing group at the Gates Foundation and we did our audits and we made sure the money was spent wisely. But his philosophy was, look, if, because, you know, one of the countries involved in the end of polio was Nigeria. And people would say, oh, you're going to waste money in Nigeria. There's all sorts of corruption. And he said, if I woke up every day and thought about corruption, I would never do anything. Um, and, and so you can over worry about the money going running or some big fraud or something like that and under worry about who's going hungry or who's sick and, or who's suffering. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of on the Bill Gates camp on that one. All right, with that, um, I'm gonna let Jonathan ask the last question um, of the uh, evening. And thank you again so much, Sue, this was amazing. Um, Jonathan, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, so you have a very captive audience of us here. And uh, I, I like to think of this group of uh, Silicon Valley tech to be a little bit more open than your standard Silicon Valley uh, group of people. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, like, what's the thing that you're like, God, I wish I could Silicon Valley or like just the, the group that you have in front of you. These guys always do X and like it might be something you mutter under your breath uh, to your, your friends or colleagues. Like, God, I can never say that to them. What, but like they really should hear it. What would that be? Is uh, Ruchi, uh, our, our group leader here, has a pretty thick skin and usually asks very direct questions. I'd love to hear what your what would be the the blunt thing to say to us. You know, it's it, I I don't have like any mean tweets, <laughs> 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 nothing like that. But I do think um, I do think it's so. 
I would say keep innovating, keep, you know, keep trying to make the world better. Um, and if there was advice, I would not overreact to a temper, you know, the pendulum swings, everybody in tech's great, everybody in tech's not great. Um, I would love to see, I keep coming back to health and education. I would love to see serious efforts on partnering with people in health and education to make a difference, especially education. I mean, the kids who had to go through this last school year are gonna have so much catching up to do. And I just don't see as much investment or attention to tech and education. I would love to see breakthroughs there. Okay. I'm like, oh man, that's not quite controversial enough. I feel like, I feel like people <laughs> are like, yeah, yeah, I'm just gonna nod, nod, nod our heads and just be like, that sounds, that sounds like a good thing to do. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll do a slight, a slight, a slight tweak. Like maybe with your in in your career as it as it moved from uh, uh, the the different organizations you've worked with, uh, from like a more personal lens and kind of like in terms of like a, you, you talked about one of the driving forces for yourself was kind of um, thinking about how do we reduce suffering? Like, how can mm -hmm. I, what, what are mm -hmm. the biggest ways that I can do this? Yeah. Um, and like, I don't know, when I think sometimes about like uh, Silicon Valley myself, like there is a way that there's like this stereotype. And I think this is sometimes largely true of like people just, as many people are working on big serious things, there's like some people that are working on seemingly like more frivolous kinds of things, mm -hmm. but then, you kind of go into like who's to say what's frivolous or something but from a personal perspective for you as you kind of shifted careers and I'm imagining working with the Gates Foundation has opened up something and seeing something that you didn't see before what's something that you might be like not less so ad advice but more of like I don't know like something that impacted you deeply that feels important to share with yeah. us not necessarily like from a strategic level but from like a heart level so when, when I did my training in, at UCSF, I had lived in San Francisco and my husband and I were in San Francisco and we were just in the middle of San Francisco and eating out. And I remember how finicky I was about my coffee. And, you know, it was that kind of um, experience. And UCSF loaned us to McCary University in Kampala, Uganda, in the middle of an untreatable AIDS epidemic. And so we moved to a country that wasn't far past Amin and mostly lived without running water or electricity for two years. And the thing was that our existence was so far better than anyone we saw in our surroundings. So for me, that was one of those life-changing things. Um, and I think all of us, and I would put myself in that, just get spoiled and selfish in our little cocoon and getting out. And I experienced that again at Gates Foundation, getting out and seeing up close and personal what life is like for most people who aren't us just opens your eyes. I think it makes you better and um, more thoughtful and more generous. Um, and I, at, now that I'm home, I, I, I think when, I, when can I leave my house and how can I experience life so that I'm not in my bubble again. Cause it really, for me, it's really powerful. 